Hello, I'm Dan Bowles, and this is the seventh video lecture in a series to teach the principles of our physical existence as presented in my book, Are We Just Bubbles? An Alternate View of Existence. In this lecture, we will begin to see how electromagnetic energy can exhibit itself as a wave or a particle, and why there is uncertainty in the position of a minute particle in very short periods of time. The mystery of dark energy will be revealed. We will see why time cannot go backward and why entropy increase prevails in our universe. According to what I believe and have presented in my book, our entire universe consists solely of what I call space bubbles. Everything associated with what we consider physical, space, matter, energy, time, forces of all kinds, exist to, due to this one substance, a substance comprised of individual space bubbles. These bubbles are identical in properties, but are individual entities that cannot share their space material with another. The amazing thing about these bubbles is that even though everything is made of them, they are invisible to us individually. In their most free state, they make up vacuum space. So all of our universe space, space that we consider empty, is not really empty in fact. It just seems empty because we can't see anything physical there. In reality, space consists of the most basic component and is physical because it makes up universe space in an otherwise empty void of non-universe space. In our physical reality, existence only happens when these space bubbles expand. All physical properties are caused by the expansion of the space bubbles. So even though all the space bubbles in our universe occupy volume in the void, and might still exist in another dimension if they stopped expanding, the universe that we know would cease to exist if the expansion stopped. The creative expansion within each of the bubbles is really the dark energy of existence. This expansion is not to be confused with the Hubble expansion of the universe that we can observe. The dark energy expansion is occurring at what we consider the speed of light and actually defines the speed of light, even though it may not be necessarily constant throughout the universe. The creative expansion within each bubble is causing an invisible space expansion into the void and everything in our universe is expanding along with it. Matter which is made up of clumped groups of space bubbles is more dense than vacuum space and has a property of mass that is proportional to the density ratio of the group to the vacuum space. The space bubbles within the mass are expanding also, but they are restricted such that the entire mass expands in proportion to the vacuum space. That way distances in space and all objects within it appear to be remaining constant in size to us. But in reality, vacuum space is expanding at the speed of light into the void and all matter is expanding in proportion with it. As I mentioned before, the rate of stationary vacuum space bubble expansion actually defines the speed of light. Since it is through ripples and expansion past one bubble to the next that light travels through space. So if the dark energy or absolute energy or energy of existence or whatever you want to call it is invisible to us, what is the energy that we can see exhibited in our universe? It turns out we can only see a change in the expansion rate ratio between two portions of space. If we let the symbol delta represent a general change in the value of a variable, and we let delta V sub n represent the normal volume expansion of vacuum space 
over a given period, and we let delta V sub E represent the proportional expansion of a sample volume of universe space over the same period. Then we can define visible energy in terms of a change in the volume expansion ratio by this formula. Now for those that are mathematically inclined, this would be like the derivative, the second derivative of the volume expansion. So energy equals the change in the quantity of change in volume under, of the volume of space under consideration to the uh, change in the normal uh, vacuum space expansion and that quantity then times a constant. If the volume ratio change is positive then energy is released in the sample volume. If it's negative then energy is stored in that volume. If the ratio remains constant with vacuum space expansion then there is no energy activity visible in the sampled volume. Now note it, notice that in order to see a change, a change in this ratio, we have to have, at some point, have to have matter in this thing. We can't just have the change of the vacuum space over the change in the vacuum space because that would just that would, that change would be zero. If we use the vacuum space expansion as the normal, and then a quantity of matter associated with its density, known as its mass, suddenly increases its expansion rate to that of free space, then an incremental positive change in the volume of that mass to that of free space is seen as a release of energy. Mass is converted to energy as in Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. In other words, a quantity of dense space bubbles represented by its mass incrementally increases its volume in absolute space to that of free space volume by the application of the c squared term. Inversely, if a portion of space has a negative change in expansion, visible energy is stored in it. Note here that energy is not conserved in our universe. It just appears that way because the relationship between the storing and releasing of visible energy with that of absolute energy is constant. But in fact, the visible energy is ultimately coming from the continuing invisible creative expansion of space. A photon is no more than a slightly compressed group of vacuum space bubbles rippling through the stationary space medium. And it is the ripple that is traveling at the speed of light, not an actual particle. Since the photons consist of a slightly denser group of vacuum space bubbles, it would technically have mass if it were stationary, but gravity cannot act on it because the ripple is traveling at the speed of light, as would be any force trying to act on it. It is the warping of vacuum space by gravity, as discussed earlier, that causes light to bend around a massive object, not the effect of gravity on a photon. The particle behavior of a photon impinging upon a target is caused by its virtual mass of slightly den denser vacuum space bubbles at the target site upon the expansion wave arrival. Now I want to mention again that even though absolute expansion of space defines the speed of light and is the basis for time happening, it is not necessarily happening at a constant rate throughout the universe. Vacuum space in some portions of the universe may be denser than other portions, especially when comparing outer boundary regions with ones away from the boundaries. As these regions and the expansion rates in them change, the light energy traveling at the, at the expansion rate in the different regions can appear to be Doppler shifted as seen by the redshift. Our universe is expanding 
but it might not be as we think when assuming that light speed is uniform throughout the universe. Heat energy. We've been talking about energy from an expansion space bubble perspective, which is ultimately the source of it. But more often, we see the resulting incremental expansion of atoms and molecules exhi exhibited as thermal, thermal or heat energy. But what is heat? Basically, it means the level of agitation of electrons, atoms, and molecules in a substance. And by this, I mean how much, how fast, and how far they move around in the vacuum space bubble medium over a period of time. Most of what we see in heated gases and solids is kinetic energy, the energy of motion. When an object with mass is moving through a vacuum space bubble medium, the energy that it took to get it moving is stored in the so-called compressed vacuum space bubbles in front of the moving object, as we discussed in the inertia lecture. And it is liberated whenever the motion is slowed down and the vacuum space bubbles are decompressed to their original size of normal expansion. In a gas such as hydrogen, the molecules are not bound together in a rigid configuration like they are in a solid, and they are free to move around in their immediate space. The temperature of the gas indicates how much the molecules are moving around, how fast they are moving, and the level of the kinetic energy of motion in them. The molecules impinging upon the impenetrable walls of an enclosure is what causes the force and pressure of containing the gas. In a solid, it is a cloud of electrons, sort of like a swarm of bees surrounding the nucleus, that gain velocity, jump to higher shells, and take up a bigger volume as the temperature increases. The kinetic energy or heat energy of the solid is stored in the motion of the electrons around the nuclei of the atoms. And molecules with the same kinetic energy or temperature collide with one another, the collisions are elastic. That is, on an average, no kinetic energy is transferred between them. If the molecules are of a different temperature, the kinetic energy is exchanged between them until an equilibrium is reached. The transfer of kinetic energy action is called heat flow and naturally moves one way from a hot to a colder object. In order to extract thermal energy to do useful work for us, there has to be heat flow. The natural flow is always from a hotter object to a cooler one. This is stated as fact because the opposite of this has never been observed. If two objects of different temperature are brought together in an isolated environment, where none of the heat energy can escape, the heat energy from the hotter object will flow to the colder one until the temperature of the two objects are equal. This natural flow is irreversible. That is, heat cannot be made to flow from a colder object to a hotter one without adding external energy. Useful energy can only be extracted when heat is flowing from a hotter object to a cooler one. This is so because, the only, because only the difference between the kinetic energy in the molecules and the electrons in the hotter object to the cooler one can be converted to another form during the transfer. This phen phenomenon is essentially the second law of ther thermodynamics and its implications are that the efficiency of any device or process to extract thermal energy in another form to do useful work will always be less than 100%. This lost unrecoverable energy phenomenon is also caused an increase in entropy. This natural behavior, such as the, much to the chagrin of perpetual motion and free energy hopefuls, is the demise of the cleverly designed devices. It is true, according to what I believe, 
that all things physical have energy continually flowing into them from a source outside of our universe, as my metaphysics and New Age friends had proposed. But unfortunately, the energy is the invisible absolute energy, the one-way creative expansion of space volume, and it is used up, so to speak, while causing our existence. Earlier I mentioned that time passes as a result of the linear expansion of space. More precisely, time passes as a result of the independent volume expansion of space and is a scalar quantity. It can be expressed functionally as a linear expansion of absolute space in terms of absolute volumetric expansion. We will work with spherical volumes for ease of understanding and calculating since the shape of the volume under consideration is arbitrary. In this case, the diameter of the sphere will be used as a measurement subject, and its volume increase of the sphere is a sought-after item. Here we have a representation of a sphere, a, a diameter D. The volume of the sphere, then, is, the vo is equal to pi over 6 times the diameter cubed. If we put the diameter in terms of volume expansion, which is an independent thing, the diameter of the sphere is equal to the cube root of the quantity 6 over pi times the cube root of the volume of the sphere. Now these units, uh, when we're talking about space, would have to be in a what I call the Prince units is independent of volume of uh, universe expansion. Time passes in a spherical volume of the universe space during an interval of volume expansion as defined by this equation. Time is equal to the change in the diameter times some constant, which is equal to the constant times the cube root of 6 over pi times cube root the change in the two volume, the initial and the ending volume. Where k is a constant for seconds and diameter is the sphere diameter in princes. Now princes is a unit that I uh, named as the initial size, the initial diameter of the universe when it came into existence. It's the only thing that we can relate to in our dimensions that is unchanging with uh, space expansion. So from this we can see that if time passes as independent independent linear expansion of space then a change in the diameter of the spherical volume of space under consideration relates directly to the passage of time. Now I want to mention again here we cannot use our measurement standards like the meter to calculate this. Remember that we and our measurement standards are expanding with the universe and it is this expansion that causes time to pass. So we must use an unchanging standard of length like the Prince if we want to try to calculate the total time that the universe has been in existence. The Prince is the initial size of the universe when it came into existence. Notice that in all of our discussions, space is always expanding. This is so because there is nothing in our universe that can make space go back to where it came from. Its expansion can be slow to almost a stop, as in a black hole, but it cannot be reversed. This is also why time can be slowed down but not stopped or reversed. If we knew the total absolute volume of the universe at any given instant, we could calculate the average time the universe has been in existence. We could use its initial volume of pi, uh, pi over 6 inches cubed and, and set its diameter of 1 inch at time equal to 0. Then the ratio of the new diameter in this, like down here, the ratio of the new diameter to the one Prince original diameter would re relate directly to the amount of time the universe has been in existence. But, 
from our existence point in the universe. We can only deduce what the dimensions might be from our observations. There is only one connection between the void, absolute Prince units, and our expanding, expanding universe meter units, and that is the speed of light. But this speed might not be consistent in absolute units throughout the universe, and is in all probability not consistent. And since all actions in the universe depend upon absolute space expansion to exist, we may never know how much time has passed since the universe began. As we have seen, space expansion from within each of the space bubbles is a cause of existence and cause of all actions in the universe. To observe anything, expansion must occur and resulting time must pass. In order to observe an action, we must view a volume of our expanding universe over a period of its expansion. The expansion causing time to pass for an object being observed is an average expansion of all of the space bubbles within it. And this is reference to the average space bubble expansion in the volume of our measurement standard, which we consider as constant. Since the expansion of small clumps of bubbles in the form of matter, such as subatomic particles, is the result of randomly occurring expansion of its space particle components, it is logical to conclude that its position might be uncertain at any given instant in time. This averaging smooths out all of the little quantum steps in volume change and we do not have the resolution to see these smaller increments of expansion when we try to, to view them in short periods of time. Time has no meaning when we are talking about viewing the position of subatomic particles. It is only when we look at where it was over a longer period of time in larger volumes that we see its action. So this is Heisenberg here and he's trying to guess where the the little subatomic particles are going to be, which are represented by little jumping beams. This concludes Lecture 7. Thank you for listening.